Thanks, Jim, and thanks to the Soil Health Institute for having me. This is my third meeting uh, joining the Institute, and it's been great to see the Institute grow and see the work on policy continue to grow, to grow, especially now as we head into or deep in the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, so again, I'm Alyssa from National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, or NSAC. We are based in Washington, D.C. and going to give a quick update on what's going on in terms of the 2018 Farm Bill. So just a note on NSAC and how we do our work. We are a grassroots alliance of over 120 member organizations all around the country uh, working together to improve federal food and farm policy. We've been doing this for over 30 years. We also work with our partners and allies like the Soil Health Institute uh, all over the country. The way that we do our work, our members and the farmers they work with are, the, um, are at the center of what drives our policies. We hear from the farmers and stakeholders, they give feedback to our member organizations. Those members then help us translate what they're hearing and seeing on the ground in terms of policy changes that are needed into policy proposals. We work with our team in DC to then advocate for that policy change, uh, both with Congress and with USDA. Uh, just a most recent example of kind of how that priority process works. We, back in the fall of last year, released our 2018 Farm Bill platform. This is a comprehensive strategy for the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, more than 100 pages of kind of detailed proposals driven by our member organizations all across um, the Farm Bill and conservation, crop insurance, local and regional food systems, much, much more than we're able to touch on today. But if you want to get into the details, would encourage you to, to dig in on our more comprehensive policy platform. So just to give ourselves a, a step back and kind of policy 101 refresher, the different processes that matter when we're talking about policy and farm bill, um, we have elections. They matter a lot because that is how we get our champions into office who help advance important soil health and sustainable agriculture policy priorities. NSAC does not work on elections and we are nonpartisan, but recognize the importance of that process. Authorization, that is what we are talking about right now when we talk about the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, this is your basic how a bill becomes a law. The way that we engage there is supporting good legislation, stopping legislation that is counter to our goals. Um, and this is key to developing programs, getting new money, advancing changes related to policies and programs that reflect those needs we're hearing from our members across the country. Additional processes that matter for the Farm Bill, the annual appropriations process. The Farm Bill provides mandatory money for some programs, um, but in other cases, it simply authorizes those programs without any money. So that is discretionary money that needs to get, re that needs to get appropriated each year. Um, examples of programs for which the appropriations process matters a lot, are the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, or SARE, conservation technical assistance, all driven by that annual appropriations process. Next up, um, we are not done once the Farm Bill gets passed. We have to actually implement those changes and policies that get put into law. Um, so this includes the rulemaking process after the bill is actually passed. It also includes how do we um, work with the administration to ensure that we are getting these policies and programs implemented out in the field? And then finally, evaluation. This is an ongoing process of understanding what's working, what's not working, driving our work to set um, proposals for the next Farm Bill and beyond. So what is the Farm Bill? Um, it is a comprehensive bill that really sets the rules of the road for federal food and farm policy. It is reauthorized every five-ish years. Um, I say ish because while it is authorized for five years at a time, there is often a delay. The 2014 Farm Bill, which was the most recent Farm Bill to pass, was originally intended to be the 2012 Farm Bill. Um, so there are a lot of delays that can get in the way of getting that passed on time. 
The last farm bill was passed in February of 2014. The first farm bill was passed in 1933. This was part of FDR's New Deal, driven by both um, low commodity prices over production, but also hunger and poverty across the country in both rural and urban areas. The last farm bill um, is almost $1 trillion in spending. Um, that's over a 10-year period. And again, it impacts everything from conservation policies that matter for soil health and also rural development and organic research, farmers markets, crop insurance, um, beginning farmers, you name it, the farm bill is driving all of those policies. This is just a reminder of how that 2014 farm bill got sliced. The section that we're going to focus in on today is that conservation title. That is a mere 6% of total funding. Um, of course, implications for soil health in other titles, research, crop insurance, and beyond. Um, but as you can see here, the bulk of that spending within the Farm Bill is in the nutrition title going to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, formerly known as food stamps. Um, and as I'm sure you've been seeing in the news, that is also the bulk of what is driving um, the debate around negotiations of what a final farm bill is going to look like. So where are we now in the process? This is a detailed map of how we get to a final farm bill and just to get you up to speed on what has happened so far. The Farm Bill starts with the Agriculture Committees, the House and Senate. Um, those are the committees that have jurisdiction over the Farm Bill. Both the House and Senate have passed their draft versions within committee. The House did so on May 3rd. Um, this was on a partisan vote without a single Democrat voting in support of the bill. Again, over this debate over SNAP. Um, the Senate passed their bill on June 13th. This was a bipartisan effort with nearly every single member of the committee voting in support of the bill. From there, the committees advance their bills to the full floor of their respective chamber. Um, the House first tried to do this on May 18th. They were not successful, it failed. They tried again on June 21st and did just manage to squeak by with a vote of 213 to 211. Um, again, not a single Democrat voting in support of the bill. The Senate passed their bill on June 28th. Um, bipartisan, 86 members voting in support of that bill. They will proudly tell you more votes than any bill has, any farm bill has ever received in the Senate on the floor. Um, so from there, we've got two bills passed in the House, passed in the Senate. They now head to conference. They've got to negotiate the differences between those two bills. Uh, they have, as of yesterday, both chambers have conferees, so those are the folks who will be negotiating and trying to get us to a final bill. In the House, we have 47 conferees, including Chairman Conaway and Ranking Member Peterson. In the Senate, we have nine, nine conferees, including Chairman Roberts and Ranking Member Stabenow. Um, it is their job over the next month or so to negotiate those differences and get us to a conference report. That next step is then you have to take that negotiated bill and pass it again by the House and by the Senate. Um, we don't have a timeline for that, but both chambers are currently on recess. The Senate will be back in a, week, in a couple of weeks. The House will not be back until September. Um, Mitch McConnell has said that they will have a report done by Labor Day. That is, that is ambitious, but that is, that is what they are saying. Um, and from there, they've got to get that bill passed by the House and Senate, and then they've got to get it to the president to be signed, all this before September 30th. Uh, so the question is, are they, are they going to do it? How's it looking? Um, that leads us to consider there are a lot of issues at play outside of the priorities for soil health. Just to name a, t name a few, we've got major differences between the nutrition titles. We've got to deal with fixes to farm commodity programs, addressing crop insurance. We have to pay for those stranded programs, which mean they will not have baseline to continue um, if the farm bill were to be simply extended. We've got election year politics. We have to figure out how to fund the government also by September 30th. We have immigration debates. 
we have a trade war, we have environmental riders, um, and we have a limited number of legislative days before September 30th. The House only has 11 days that they will be in session prior to September 30th. Um, so I, I do not have a magic eight ball, but I, I leave you with that to think about our what, what is ahead pre-September 30th. Um, so what is at stake when it comes to the conservation title? There's a lot at stake and we only have a little bit of time to dig in on the details. But here, just kind of highlighting some of the significant differences between the two bills. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple and happy to chat more about the details of the two bills. Uh, working lands conservation programs, this is huge when it comes to protecting and enhancing um, soil health. The two largest conservation programs, working lands conservation programs, are the Conservation Stewardship Program and the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, CSP and EQIP. This is where I would say we see the biggest difference within the conservation titles um, in the House and Senate. The House uh, eliminates CSP entirely, so no new acres. It creates a stewardship contracts option within EQIP. That being said, fails to retain the core pieces of the program, a comprehensive approach to stewardship, a set aside of acres or dollars going to that approach, as well as a level of stewardship that you have to meet to enroll. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty significant change. The Senate, on the other hand, retains both programs. Um, we do see a cut to working lands programs. That is because we have to pay for additional increases elsewhere in the title. We would love if there was just an endless pot of money available for conservation, but unfortunately that is not the case. The Senate does also make important policy reforms to these programs, incentives for cover crops, incentives for advanced grazing, incentives for comprehensive conservation planning. So a lot of good things to, to further incentivize soil health within these two programs. Next bucket of programs, land protection programs. This includes CRP and ASAP. Um, this, I would say, the, the differences between the two bills a bit easier to, to reconcile. Both bills increase the number of acres that can be enrolled in CRP. The House bill increases that from 24 million acres to 29 million acres. Senate, a more modest increase, 20, 24 to 25 million acres. In both cases, no new money to CRP. They're making policy changes to get at um, savings to increase those acres. On the easement side of things, ASAP was created in the last Farm Bill as a consolidation of several existing easement programs. As a result, took a big hit when it comes to funding available for easements. Um, so both bills increase funding pretty significantly for ASAP. In the House, increases that from 250 million per year to 500 million per year. Senate, a bit more modest, but gets it up to 450. Uh, million by the end of the Farm Bill. Conservation outcomes, this is not program specific, but something really important when it comes to we want to be able to actually measure, evaluate, and report on the impact of these conservation programs. An important provision was included in the House bill to give USDA this authority to build on and pull from a lot of the good work that is already going on related to conservation outcomes and specifically tie that to programs. The final bucket to talk about is this linkage between conservation and crop insurance. Crop insurance being major biggest part of the farm safety net. So how can we better have a linkage between conservation and crop insurance? Several provisions included in the Senate bill that, that really gets at that. Um, I would say it's a twofold approach. One, we want to reduce barriers to ad adopting conservation practices in order to get your crop insurance support, and two, how can we in the long term actually incentivize conservation um, and recognize the risk mitigation benefits of those conservation activities through crop insurance. Um, so a lot of good, good progress moving forward on that linkage in the Senate bill. Finally, just a final note on what does the funding structure look like for the conservation title. Um, as a reminder, the 2014 Farm Bill cut 
cut funding for conservation for the first time since 1985, um, which was when we saw, when we had the first conservation title, cut funding by $4 billion, $6 billion when we factor in sequestration. Um, so a top priority is ensuring that at the very least we are not moving further backwards when it comes to conservation spending. Um, the House bill does cut spending for conservation by nearly nearly a billion dollars over 10 years. The Senate bill does not cut conservation funding. It does not put in any new funding, which means we do see these cuts to working lands programs. But again, as you can see in the chart here, less significant than the cuts that we see to working lands programs in the House. So with that, I um, would encourage folks to, to stay in touch as the process moves forward. Um, policy is, you know, as we've heard, federal programs and policies are not the be-all, end-all solution when it comes to soil health, but they are a hugely important part of the puzzle, um, and we definitely need voices and everyone at the table to, to help advance this part of the puzzle. So thank you. <laughs>